It's not safe to drink the water in Flint, Michigan, a city of nearly 100,000 northwest of Detroit. Last month, researchers found elevated lead levels in children. The county last week declared a public health emergency. Philadelphia's Mayor Jim Kenney has assembled a special task force to combat lead poisoning in the city. Last year, nearly 2,700 children in Philadelphia were found to have harmful levels of lead in their blood. Welcome to Omnia, the podcast on all things Penn Arts and Sciences. Concerns over lead poisoning were heightened in the U.S. after the contamination of a city water supply in Flint, Michigan. In Philadelphia and southeastern Pennsylvania, rates of lead exposure in children are high, especially in low-income communities. But thanks to a Making a Difference in Diverse Communities grant from Penn Arts and Sciences, a team of researchers and students led by Reto Gire and Richard Pepino of Earth and Environmental Science is educating local communities about the dangers of lead poisoning, collecting important data necessary to inform remediation efforts, and working with the city and other partners to reduce lead exposure. Reto Gire, professor and chair of the Department of Earth and Environmental Science, discusses the Philadelphia neighborhoods of Fishtown and Kensington, former industrial sites that have hazardous levels of lead in the soil. A recent development boom in the area has raised concerns about the risk of exposure now that the ground is being disturbed. These areas in Philadelphia had a lot of industry, um, including metal smelters or lead smelters. And lead smelting puts out a lot of lead into the atmosphere and that settles around the smokestacks in the soil, on the, on the roofs of the buildings. And this can be dormant if it's covered, but if you destroy the surface or if you make excavations, this dust goes in the atmosphere again, or if you have a strong wind. So some of these sites have been partially restored and uh, if you start excavating or demolishing buildings, of course, you, you create these dust clouds that you see when you pass by. This is a, a heavy metal that does not decay like a radioactive element, but once it's in the environment, it sits there and it stays there. And if we disturb the surface, it can become a problem. And that's what we see now in, in Fishtown and, and these areas. Richard Pepino is the Deputy Director of Community Outreach and Engagement Corps for the Center of Excellence in Environmental Toxicology at the Perlman School of Medicine, and he coordinates academically-based community service classes in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science. In these ABCS courses, students and faculty work with West Philadelphia public schools, local communities of faith, and community organizations to solve critical issues in a variety of areas. Pepino teaches the class speaking about lead in West Philadelphia. In particular, Kensington is an environmental justice area where a great number of the children are living in families that are well below the poverty line, probably in the range of 20 to 40 percent. So these are probably, even though lead-based paint disappeared in 78, many of these apartments have not been refurbished in any way since prior to that date, so the exposure is there. Okay, a, a nice note, the city takes it seriously and addresses it. One of the points of angst, they may be taking the lead-based paint threat seriously, but many who live in Fishtown don't think they're considering other exposures such as lead in soil. Reto Gire talks about the ways lead exposure can occur. Along with lead in the soil and paint, Philadelphia also still has many lead service lines delivering water to houses. One of the project's main goals is to work with the city and community on replacing these lines. So when we talk about lead exposure, there are two pathways. One is ingestion. So like if kids play in the backyard, they, you know, they often have their fingers dirty and then they eat something. So that's a, an easy way to expose yourself. The other one is inhalation. And that's much harder to protect oneself from. Now, when the demolition crews come in, the easiest way to take care of the dust emissions would be just to s install some sprayers with water. That's done all over the world. It's easy to install and could be managed easily. But if it's not mandated by, you know, the permit givers, then the companies probably won't do it. Um, there will be different types of lead. And uh, this adds to the complication. 
So while we know that in lead service lines you ingest it with drinking water, so there are effective ways to remediate this problem by exchanging or replacing these lead service lines. And this was also the main focus for our proposal, that we would like to help the communities understand that there is a risk. And many people don't know about this. They maybe have heard of the lead issue, but they don't know where it's coming from and how they can protect themselves. Lead surface line, and our estimates are about 140,000 exist in Philadelphia. They're there. They're a sitting risk. Do I think they lead poison kids broadly in Philadelphia? No. Do I think they poison some kids? Yes. The one thing that the National Drinking Water Advisory Council has said, every lead service line should go. They go, no risk. And Philly has a good protocol for doing it. And we're working with them as part of this grant to make it easily for the process to be done. When they replace a main, a trunk main, we w- our goal is we want every house along the line to be replaced. We want the lead service line to be stoppered and a new line put in and as low cost as possible to the people living there. An important part of the project is allowing undergraduate and graduate students to share collected data on lead levels with the impacted communities. With Penn's Netter Center for Community Partnerships, these students are working with community organizations to educate and inform individuals about their risks and rights. A big portion of this project is to engage students and interns that we train here and we let them go out to the community and bring their knowledge to the communities. That's, I think, one of the major issues and and goals that we have, to educate the population in these disadvantaged communities. If we succeed with that, we're very happy. Tabin Hassan will be working to collect data on lead levels in soil, as well as working with community organizations and schools to host soil kitchens, which will allow individuals to test their soil and learn more about risks and best practices dealing with potential lead poisoning. My name is Tavine Hassan. I'm graduating this summer from the College of Arts and Sciences with a double major in PPE, Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, and um, Environmental Studies with a minor in International Development. I'm from Houston, Texas. I grew up in Texas, but I was born in Bangladesh. So I think a lot of like the environmental justice concerns kind of come from being coming from like a developing country. I think coming to Penn and just getting involved with the sustainability community really kind of sparked that, and I like the work that we do. So. Hassan first began working in the West Philadelphia community through Pepino's ABCS course. She and other students are expanding that outreach model for the grant project, using special equipment that allows them to give the lead rates on the spot. We went around to like the parks, churches, community gardens, schools that we could, you know, kind of get into like the, you know, all the soil that we could kind of see and um, tested it for heavy metals with a focus on lead. Then we created a map of where the high lead levels are and then asked presented it at these soil kitchens and asked community members to bring their own soil samples to the said soil kitchen and we would test them on the spot with our xrf machine just to let people know and then we would tell them well 400 parts per million is the acceptable threshold if you're above it here's what you can do if it's so seriously above it, you know, we'll connect you to the right resources to get like home remediation. A couple of us are working on like listening sessions. So we're sitting down with community members inviting like block captains and just whoever wants to attend to invite them to hear their concerns and best and trying to figure out how best to address them. Um, a lot of people might not know landlords are required to give lead free or lead safe certificates if there's a child under six. So people don't really know their information. So having people know their rights and what information they're supposed to be provided with is important. So we're hoping those community sessions, community listening sessions will let us kind of expand to that. You know, you can talk about it and research it at the university level, but going into the actual community gives an entirely different experience. And I think what's really set that in stone is like Jerome Shabazz over at Overbrook Environmental Center, where we hosted our, the first two soil kitchens. He is trying to set up a core of student volunteers to go out and you know we want he wants to teach them how to sample and teach them like you know the tips to tell their family members and community members and that's something that you know from an academic standpoint we can't change hearts and minds and we can't 
get the information out there as much as the community group can. So I think it's working with Rich and this project has given me the opportunity to like really engage with the community and find a way to disseminate the information more than just learning about it. So I really enjoyed that. An important component of environmental research is that we go out to the communities and, and tell them about our results, good or bad. It's just, uh, it, it, also, it is also the right thing to do. And that raises awareness, but it also raises expectations from the population that, okay, we have a problem, we want something to happen. So we are committed to this outreach effort, whatever the topic is, and lead being a big issue, especially in the US and in the big cities. Um, that basically was a clear choice, an easy choice. Who's learning the most? I'm not sure. The community benefits more because of increased awareness. Our students benefit more because of awareness of environmental health careers. And we have seen a really significant uptake in the last decade. The number of our students to go on to elite schools to pursue environmental and public health. This has been a presentation of Penn Arts and Sciences. Special thanks to Reto Jure, Rich Papino, and Tabin Hassan in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science. To listen to previous episodes of the Omnia podcast, visit our website or subscribe to the Omnia podcast by Penn Arts and Sciences on iTunes.